Gabriel, man of valor, angel. Interesting thing, because he's the one who gives the countdown, God through him. But it's amazing because when you open up the New Testament, guess who it is who's revealing that the countdown is going to be fulfilled? Gabriel. This is Daniel's prayer of intercession. And notice he, he's saying our, now Daniel's, Daniel's a holy man, righteous, loves God, but he says our sins, he joins himself with the sins of his people, he joins himself and intercedes for them. He doesn't condemn them, he pleads with God for them. Prophetic. And then something happens. It shows you how powerful it is to pray in intercession and repentance for a nation. Something we have to remember concerning America. Something happens. Verse 20. That's the context. While I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin and the sin of my people, Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill, Jerusalem, while I was still in prayer, Gabriel, the man I had seen in the earlier vision, came to me in swift flight about the time of the evening sacrifice. He instructed me and said to me, Daniel, I've now come to give you insight and understanding. As soon as you began to pray, a word went out, and I have, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. Seventy-sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for evil, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes forth to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler comes. There will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with street and trench, but in times of trouble. After the sixty-two sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler or the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. He will confirm a covenant with one, with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Okay. This is one of the, this is one of the most amazing prophecies ever given. So amazing that there was a man who was a rabbi in Eastern Europe, an Orthodox rabbi, who saw this, and this alone caused him to become a believer in Jesus. And he started an organization called the American Board of Mission of the Jews. Now it's called Chosen People, and from that organization came Jews for Jesus. It all started with this prophecy. Let's first establish what we have seen here. The prophecy is so powerful, so exact. It has been argued by anti-missionaries and those who oppose the gospel since it was fulfilled that the main argument of the, against it among these is that it's not talking about the Messiah because the same word can be translated and anointed. It can be an anointed priest or an anointed person. It's used in the Bible, an anointed. Plus it says Mashiach Nagid, the first word anointed, but the second word prince, so it can mean an anointed prince. That's what they argue. But none of the arguments can stand. Number one, whenever the word anointed is used in the Bible, it is qualified by something, and it, be, it's, it gives a context so you know it's an anointed. This person is anointed. This is an anointed Cyrus, anointed person. But here, there is no qualification. It simply says, the anointed. It says, Mashiach, that is the word Messiah. There is no qualifier. It can only be the Messiah. Number two, in Hebrew, the adjective comes after the noun, not before it, like in English. So if it says, Mashiach Nagid, it doesn't mean the anointed prince. It means the anointed Messiah, who is also a prince or ruler. Number three, rabbis try to argue that Daniel 9 is not about the Messiah. But the thing is that, I mean, number one, again, the very word, this is the word Messiah. It's not just talking about Messiah. It's saying Mashiach and number four, Daniel 9 is, is, is the absolute clearest prophecy of when Messiah is coming in the Hebrew Scriptures. Even the rabbis in their writings say it's about Messiah. The ancient rabbis say this is about Messiah. On top of it, what is the context? The context is 
th this coming of this one is going to bring about an end of sin, atone for iniquity, finish transgression, seal of vision and prophecy. Who's going to do that? It's not going to be Marty the fish salesman. It's only the Messiah. Who could do that? It's clearly the Messiah. On top of that, there is an ancient translation of the Bible written by the rabbis before the New Testament called the Septuagint where they took the Hebrew Scriptures, put it in Greek, and you know what they did with this? When it comes to this, it says, literally, it says, until Christ comes, is what the rabbis wrote. The word they wrote is Christos, is Christ. So it's literally saying, until Christ comes, and then Christ will be cut off. The ancient rabbis before the New Testament. So it is clearly talking about the Messiah. So what is it telling us? I mean, if, without knowing anything else, what is it telling you? It's telling you this. It says Messiah will come, Messiah will be cut off, and then what does it say? It says then the city and the sanctuary will be destroyed. What city? Jerusalem, obviously. That's what it's talking about. And what's the sanctuary? The temple. So therefore, Messiah will come, then the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, the temple, will be destroyed. So do we know if that happened? Well, it happened. It happened in the year 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. So what does that, what does that mean? It means whoever the Messiah is, he had to have come before the date 70 AD. No matter what. Anybody who comes after that is disqualified. And there have been many Jewish people who came up among the Jewish people and said, we're the Messiah. After the fact, they cannot be. Do we know of anybody who came before the year 70 AD who came as Messiah and is, has a reasonable claim? Is there anybody in Jewish history? There's only one in all of Jewish history before the year 70 AD, actually after it just as well, but before the year, there's only one contender. There's no number two runner-up. There's only one, and he happens to be known around the world as the Christ, which is the translation of Messiah. Only one. There's only one famous for dying for sins, Daniel 9. He'll be cut off. He'll make an end of sin. Matches up with Isaiah 53. He will die for sin. Could God, you put it all together, could God make this any clearer than that? But then there are the 77s. What are they? Sometimes you'll hear it said, the 70 weeks of Daniel, the 77s. Well, the word, is just, it just in the Hebrew says 77, so we translate that as weeks or sevens. Now, what is it? 77s of what? It's a time period, clearly. Is it 77s of days? It can't be, because 77s of days would be 490 days, and it's talking about it saying Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt, the temple's going to be rebuilt, it's all going to be, well, you cannot do that in a year, less than a year and a half. The context clearly is years. And it's already there in the context. So how does Daniel begin it? Daniel begins by saying, I was studying the words of the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah, it was revealed to him that the Jewish people would be in exile for how many? 70 years. 70 years. Now, why were they in exile for 70 years? Why? They were there for, I mean, of course, for judgment. Well, why 70 years? God says it. He says they will be in exile for every Sabbath year they did not observe. Now it's not, it's for many, you know, they were offering up their children as sacrifice. That, but the timing is linked to the Sabbath year, the Shemitah. So what it's saying here is this. For every year that the land didn't rest, every seven years was a Sabbath year, the land was supposed to rest. So now the land is going to rest for all those 70, all those 70 Sabbaths while the people are going to be in exile. So, now, now, now concentrate. 70 years, those 70 years in of exile of the land resting represents how many years? It's 70, 70 Sabbath years, so it represents a period of how many years? 490 years that they didn't observe the Sabbath year. So it comes up to 70 Sabbath years. You get it? Are you with me? 70, how do you do in math? 490 years, they did not observe the Sabbath year. So how many Sabbath years? 70 Sabbath years. You get it now? So it represents a period of 490 years. Where they, so it goes into, now it becomes 70 years of judgment. Now God is taking 70 years of judgment, and he is now 
decompressing them that they're going to become 490 years to redemption. You get it now? You had, you had 490 years of sin. They get compressed into 70 years of judgment. Now the 70 years of Daniel are going to become 490 years to Messiah. Okay? Redemption. All right. Now, so he's clearly speaking of 77s of years, 490 years to go. Okay. Now this God is giving a prophetic countdown which no other faith ever does. No other faith steps out. It gives an exact countdown. Now, interesting, because the Bible says, because Daniel says that Gabriel appeared to me with this. When? He appeared to me, it says, at the time of the evening sacrifice. Now, there was, this the interesting thing is there was no sacrifice. There was no temple. So why that make a point? There's something about that. It says he came at the time of the evening sacrifice, but there was no sacrifice. Interesting, he still came at the set time. Why? Because the, the evening sacrifice was the final sacrifice of the day, final sacrifice. And what is the prophecy gonna be about? The prophecy is gonna be about the final sacrifice of Messiah. So he does it at the time of the final sacrifice, even though there's no temple, but there will be. Gabriel, 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 Man of valor, angel. Interesting thing. Because he's the one who gives the countdown, God through him. But it's amazing because when you open up the New Testament, guess who it is who is revealing that the countdown is going to be fulfilled? Gabriel. Same guy who gave the countdown is the one in the New Testament opens it up. When he gives a word to the, pre to the priest, Zechariah, that now it's about to get rolling because that countdown is going to be fulfilled. Messiah is coming. How cool, how perfect he appears to Zechariah. Zechariah, the priest, the father of John the Baptist. Then he appears to whom? Mary, Miriam. It's this, but it's all about the countdown to Messiah. Now we have another cool thing. When you read about the birth of Messiah, you read about who? The Magi come. Now the Magi come, and they come from the east. And they come seeking the king of the Jews who is born. Now, how did they know that? From looking up at the stars, and they, is, is that, could that have told? They, they saw a star, and some people, it's conjecture, but they, they saw they, there was a star they could have linked to Judah, and a star they could have linked to the king, and all coming together. Okay, but how do you get it that exact to know this is talking about the king of the Messiah, that they're coming to do that? How? Well, we have a clue. You know, you know how they might know? Because if you look at the book of Daniel you'll find that he was made chief of the wise men. And the word specifically refers to the Magi. The Magi came from where? Persia. Persia is where Daniel got the vision. Today, where is it? Iran. Iran and Israel. we got to pray. But here it is. So, so therefore, Daniel may have instructed, may have passed down the knowledge of the vision to the wise men who then, years later, are the Magi. And that would have given them an idea of when it was going to happen. The Roman historian, Suetonius and Tacitus, both say that at that time in the Eastern world, there was a rumor, an expectation that a king was going to arise at that time out of Judea. Where did that come from at that time? Well, it's Daniel who gives the timing. So when does the countdown start? When? It says, the, the angel tells him, from the time of the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now there are two famous times of that. One is Cyrus. The other is another Persian king, Artaxerxes. Cyrus made a proclamation beginning it all. But the one who made it more completely, and, and it, it actually would involve the wall, which the prophecy speaks about the street, and the wall was the Persian king Artaxerxes. Now, I want to give you some historical coordinates where ev how everything comes together. But concentrate, because I'm not giving you milk, I'm giving you solid meat. 
Luke 3, 1 says this, timing. It says, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, John started preaching. Everything begins. Everything begins. Now, now, if you put it together, and there most likely was a co-regencies, we won't get into that, and we also put together the fact that it says that Messiah was around 30 years old, could, he could have been 28, could have been 32, 33, but it's around 30, and you look at the time when Messiah had to be born, which is before Herod dies, Herod the Great died in 4 BC, Messiah was born before that, and most likely two years, because he says, kill all the children according to the star, who are up to two years old, so that puts you around 6 BC. And you go ahead, when you put it all together, Tiberius was made emperor or co-emperor with Augustus in the year 11 or 12 AD, and you, you add the years, and it comes out to around the year 26, 27 AD, around that time. So you have that, so around that time, you would have had the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist, and then Messiah, 26, 27, or the end of 26, maybe coming into Jerusalem, Passover. So what about the countdown now of Daniel? The angel said, you are to know and discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore, rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven sevens and Six and two, 62 seven, so it comes out to, we won't go in, comes out to 69 sevens of years. That comes out to 483 years. And then it talks about that last seven, which we're not going to get into yet. That's the end times. That's the tribulation. That's book of Revelation. We're going to get into it next time. But you got a missing seven. So you got 400, you got 483 years. You have one seven year period missing out of the 490. Okay, so. What happens now if we begin the countdown, we begin the countdown from that issuing of the decree from the King Artaxerxes, where does it lead you? It, it, that issuing of that decree took place in the year 457 BC. Add 483 years, the 62 plus seven, sevens, you don't have to go in, you have to remember all the math, but add that, that 483 years, where does it lead you? It leads you to the year 26, 27 AD. The same year, the overwhelming year, when the ministry of Messiah begins. This is amazing. It's giving you the exact year. And it's the first time he would have come to Jerusalem points to the very year that Messiah comes. So it's not just that Messiah, it's telling you Messiah has to come before the year 70 AD. That's, that's enough. But it's telling you he'd begin his ministry about the time 26, 27 AD, which is exactly where everything points to. Now, there's only one person in human history who could be seriously considered as the Messiah and who came before the destruction of the temple and his coming happened to be at that exact time foretold by the countdown of Daniel. Now, this is gigantic, so gigantic, that people have to try to explain it away, say it's not talking about the Messiah. Well, clearly it is. So here it's giving you the year, the date, and the Hebrew year is between those two. But there's another thing here that you wouldn't see in English, but it's there in Hebrew. Now, I want to tell you a word Shavah, try it. Shavah, we get the word, the word is, or Sheva, the word is seven. Seventy Shavah, seven, 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 Shavi. It's the word seven keeps coming up in that prophecy. Seven, seven, seventy, sixty-two, seven, seven, sevens, all that. And I want you to see something about that word, Sheva, because there's something else that's going to kind of, just going to kind of join to it together. It says in Daniel, 70 shevahs, or 70 sevens, or 70 weeks. But the word, the word shevah also has a double meaning. And you know what it means? The word seven in Hebrew means something else. You know what it means? It means an oath, to swear an oath. Why? Because when they swore, it said they would swear seven times. So the word seven not only means seven in Hebrew, it means an oath, an oath. Now, in the Bible, there's a chapter, Genesis 22, where God says, I swear by myself. 
And when is it? It's when he tells Abraham, take your only son Isaac and take him up to the land of Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice. And then, of course, God stops him. It was just testing him. But Abraham takes his son, puts him on a donkey. They go up to Jerusalem. He gets to the mountain of Moriah, because that's where it is, Jerusalem, puts the wood on his shoulders, makes Isaac carry it up to the place of sacrifice, binds him to the wood, lifts up to sacrifice. God stops him. And then he says, Abraham, because you have done that, I, I, will, can, I, will, I swear by myself, I will bless you. I will fulfill the covenant. So, so what happened? Here you have a father takes a son. And so, so God is going to, if one person on, this, on a covenant, if one person does it, then the other person has to be willing to do it. God says, because you did that, God's saying, I'm going to do this. And so what happens? 2,000 years later, God takes his son, the father, puts him on a donkey, leads him to the same place, Jerusalem, has him carry the wood just like Isaac on his shoulders to the place of the sacrifice. They lay him just as Isaac was. He is laid on the wood, bound together, and then he is pierced, and it is Messiah is sacrificed where? On Mount Moriah. What is on Mount Moriah? The Temple Mount and Calvary. Amazing. And so God said, by myself I swear. What does that mean? When you swear by something, you're lifting it up. By my mother, by my, my whatever. I'm, you're lifting it up as collateral. God swearing by himself. What does that mean? That means he's lifting up his own life as collateral. So he's going to offer himself. But that word swear, in Hebrew, when he says, I swear, the word that he uses is shava, which is the same word that's used in, basically, in Daniel. Daniel, when it, Daniel says 77s, you can take it as 70 oaths of God. It's 77s, but it's God. He's confirming. He's saying, I'm going to fulfill all my promises in this one act. When the Messiah dies, all my promises are in that. And it's all going to take us. So, so Daniel has that, has that word, and then this has that word. Daniel is telling you when it's going to happen. This is telling you where it's going to happen. So you put it together in this year as it comes to, to this time. The Bible is saying Messiah is going to die at that time. And where is it going to be? It's going to be in the place where the mountain where Abraham offered up Isaac, which is Mount Moriah, which is Calvary. God is so perfect. He puts it all together. Amazing. He's telling you where. He's telling you when. He's telling you what day. Passover is another thing. But let's go further. Another mystery. When Gabriel appears in the New Testament, who does he speak to first? Zechariah. Where's Zechariah? He's in the, he's in the temple. He's in the temple. And where is he in the temple? He's, at the, he's offering up the incense, which is right in front of the Holy of Holies. It's right in front of the veil. It's right on the verge of where atonement takes place, where it all, all redemption takes place. It's right there. Why? It's like a, it's, God is like showing something in time and space that that's where the moment was. They're right, they're right at the verge of redemption. It's going to come. And so, he, so here's the, the priest is standing by the veil of the Holy of Holies. Messiah is going to, going to bring redemption. They're right at the verge of it. And when was it, did we say, that Gabriel appeared to Daniel? He's, it says at the evening offering, at the time of the evening sacrifice. Well, you know when the, the incense that Zechariah offered up, you know when it could be offered up? It's either at the morning sacrifice or the evening sacrifice. It's most likely the evening because it's the same time that Gabriel started the countdown. Now he appears at the time of the offering. He keeps on appearing at the time of the offering because it's all about the offering of Messiah. And so most likely it's 3 p.m. Now, now something else about this. Think about this. Gabriel appears at the time of the evening sacrifice and he prophesies of what? Of the sacrifice of Messiah. When was Messiah, when did he die? He died at the ninth hour. When is that? That's 3 p.m. When is that? That's the, that's the exact time of the evening sacrifice. So here, from the very beginning, the time of Messiah's sacrifice, when, when Gabriel gives the time, he's actually appearing at the time Jesus is going to die. When he will be cut off. 
But there's also more because that word Sheva, all that word that keeps coming up in the prophecies of Daniel, the 77, 70 Shevas, oath, also swearing, promise of God. God sent Gabriel to appear in the temple to Zechariah. Zechariah. And he gives him a sign concerning that he's going to have a son. His wife, who could not have children and older now, is going to bear a son. It's going to be John the Baptist. It's going to begin everything. Who was his wife? His wife's name was Elizabeth. What is Elizabeth in Hebrew? It's Eli Sheva. Same word. Oath. God, the oath of God. And what does Zechariah's name mean? Zechariah, Zechariah means God has remembered. So you got God has remembered and you got the oath of God. Put them, to, put them together, marry them, and it becomes God has remembered the oath of God. God has remembered his oath. It's amazing because that, that thing actually comes up in the songs when, he, when, when Zechariah is singing. He talks about, and, and Mary then sings similarly, but talks about he has remembered his oath. God remembered his oath, and he remembered the 77s of Dan, and remembered all his promises, and he brought them together. So when you put, you got a God has remembered, Zechariah, bring them, comes together with Elisheva, Elizabeth, oath of God. They come together, and they bear a son. And what's the son's name? Yochanan John, which means the grace of God. God has remembered his covenant, his oath. He remembered the sevens. also means God has remembered his sevens, the 77s of Daniel. And so it's going to produce the grace of God. Now, before we bring this home, now let me tell you, I'm going to bring something. When we do part two, we're going to focus on that last period of seven, that tribulation, revelation, antichrist, all that. That's where the last seven, that was missing. But before we bring this home tonight, very cool thing. What were the 77s of Daniel about? They were about the end of what? The end of the exile, end of the 70 years of captivity, and now God's purposes are going forward. He's going to rebuild Jerusalem. Messiah's going to come. All that. And so it's about a 70-year period that ends with a proclamation of a world leader that has to do with Jerusalem. Well, right now, we are at the end of another 70-year period of Israel's history. No less prophetic. Israel was raised from the dead in the year 1948. Add 70 years, where does it come? 2018 right now. 70 years ago this year, 70 years ago this month, 70 years ago this week. I didn't plan this message to go this way. But what happened, what happened at the end of the 70 year period in ancient times? A king issues a proclamation recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. What happened at the end of this 70-year period of Israel's existence? A king, a world leader, issues a proclamation recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. For the first time since ancient times, a world power, a major world power, has recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. In the ancient case of Cyrus and then Artaxerxes, the proclamation set in motion prophetic events which would lead to the fulfillment of God's prophetic purposes and the coming of Messiah. So what events will be set in motion now to lead to the fulfillment, you know? The first, the first countdown, the first 70 year and proclamation at the end led to the first coming of Messiah. What will the second lead to? Could it be the second coming? Amazing, I didn't plan it, but this Monday, on the Western calendar, is the exact 70-year mark of the history of Israel. The exact 70-year mark, May 14th. At midnight, May 15th, of that Monday night, Tuesday, that's exactly when Israel came into existence. And on that day, they're planning to move the American embassy to Jerusalem. On the 70-year mark, linked to recognizing Jerusalem like Cyrus did, what will it lead to? We shall see. But what does this all tell you? The 77, you don't have to, have to get all the math, but you, you, get the, you get the gist here. The 77s of Daniel, what an amazing thing. There's nothing like this in the text of any religion, any faith, any ideology. A countdown giving the exact time of Messiah's coming and it happened just as they said.
This is Jonathan Kahn. If you were blessed by the part of the message you just saw, you can get a copy of the full message and see it in its entirety. And you can see the full catalog of all my messages. Just go to hopeoftheworld.org slash order. And you can get any message on DVD, CD, download them on MP4, MP3. Just go to hopeoftheworld.org slash order.